Testing, one, two. Om Mantra Nam Jiva Bhuta Tulya Shmita Shakti Rupaya Tatahina Vavarohe Nishvalaha Sharda Bharat Om Shanti 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 She whom the seers know and remember as the imperishable Shakti is the meaning in all the slokas and the sutras of the religious scriptures of the different traditions of the world. Without her, O oh fair ones, all the tattvas would be like clouds with no rain. She is the perfect eye consciousness existing in all the multitude of words and the secret of all the mantras whose very being is the essence of non-duality. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Mahiran Maya Parikoshi Virajan Brahmaniskalam Tachu Brahm Jyoti Sham Jyoti Tadyadatma Vidu Vidu Om Shanti 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 Shining like burnished gold, highest and deepest, the core intelligence of living beings, partless and indivisible, ever pure free of all taint, the essence in everything which all beings seek, either knowingly or unknowingly, there shines Brahman. It is that which the Guru teaches, it is that which the wise ones exult in, Om peace, peace, peace. Om Sahana. Om Sahana Vavitu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavohai Tejasvi Navadita Mastu Ma Vidveshovahai Om Shanti 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 <coughs> May Brahman, Divine Reality, protect us. May it sustain us. May it illumine our thinking consciousness. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the Dharma teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us. May peace be unto all. Om Hari Om And as we did last night with this mudra, Svagatam, we welcome the Divine Mother into our presence on our puja last night. Uh, we do the same to all of you today here on location at the SRV Ashram in Portland and also the live streaming audience which is joining us late, albeit, because we had some technical difficulties hooking up here. Uh, it seems like difficulties are showering upon us. And the Rishis mentioned in the Upanishads, 
Our children are showering grace upon us. The corn growing in the fields is showering grace upon us. And so they were in a state of very high-mindedness, but also in a period that was much less cluttered by distractions and and uh, stick to the pointisms were were more present there. The, the main point, of course, being Brahman. If you want to narrow it down to one, but what I just chanted was two, basically that primordial Shakti, who assumes names and forms. Uh, and then that nameless, formless presence of Brahman, which is so difficult to determine and to find within us. Uh, according to them, the ancient rishis, maybe it's the most natural thing. Being the most simple, it tend to be easily overlooked. And that's certainly case, the case today. But the reason for overlooking it was not its subtlety in the old days, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it was not the many distractions in the old days, but was just its subtlety. Today, we have so many distractions. I remember my Tibetan teacher, Zhang Gong Kantro Rinpoche, saying that in this day and age, when he came to the West, he saw that distractions were the main problem in spiritual practice. And uh, so we have to find ways to keep the mind from wandering. Uh, maybe uh, not uh, find so many excuses to let the mind wander, too, because <clears throat> anything that we think might be a serious endeavor could actually just be worthless, <laughs> existing in Maya as it does, and not bring the kinds of fruits that you're looking for. You know what Jesus said about that, you store up your fruits in heaven, your treasures in heaven. So this heaven, of course, is beyond the heaven of the ancestors. Uh, in, in the way the Vedic religion would explain that. But nevertheless, the point is well taken, is that these Dharma drops, as Buddha called it, 500 years before Jesus came to earth, Buddha was saying, these Dharma drops are falling and you don't have a bucket. You see? So that's life without any uh, receptacle for beautiful spiritual things that we were just hearing about when Niran John was reading from the Gospel this morning. Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Everything he says is about Dharma drops. And uh, we all here are e either in the midst of or already have possessed in possession our, our bucket of catch all. You know, I mean, in Hawaii, we use catchment a lot from, from the skies to get our water. Uh, so um, that's what we need. It's a good metaphor physically for what we need spiritually and probably as I was saying yesterday even mentally and uh, philosophically we need to be able to catch something long enough to contemplate it uh, and then uh, understand what it's communicating to us and then retain it. Re retentive memory is a very beautiful thing like my teacher Swami Asheshnandaji Maharaj whose pictures there on our mantle who taught us all just up the street here, a few blocks? He would uh, he would say he would chant the Gita from memory. You know, the, it's a pretty thick book. Uh, even if you slim it down to just its slokas without the commentaries, but he could chant that in his 90s by memory. And so he would give us some blessed food to eat, and then he'd stand up there while we ate it, just chanting from the Gita for minutes at a time. Uh, so that was retentive memory in its manifestation, right standing there right before us. And he had been a celibate monk since his 20. Uh, in India, he took his sanya, he took his initiation from Holy Mother, which means that all of us have Holy Mother, as all of you who have taken initiation have Holy Mother as your, in your line of gurus. So last night at the puja, you saw me uh, when we were doing the nyasas and salutations of the guru, you saw me, I'm Guru Bhyana Maha. So I would thank Swami Sheshananda. I also throw like six in there too as my Western teacher. Uh, and then just throw them in, you know. Yeah. And uh, then you go a little higher tier, you see, and you say, I am Guru Parama Guru uh, uh, Bhyana Maha. So that would mean the teacher of my teacher was Holy Mother. 
So she's my Parma Guru. And then I would go a little higher and I'd say, Om Pada Pada Guru Bio Namaha. That would be Sri Ramakrishna, who is Holy Mother's teacher, as it were. <laughs> Fortunately, also the Divine Mother of the Universe and her and his Divine Consort. And then at the very top is uh, I'm Paramesti. So Paramesti is the name of the Divine Mother, which we chanted last night in some of those songs we were singing. And then you make it all auspicious by going Om Ganeshaya Namaha. And then in the middle you salute your, your personal guru, which in SRV would be Sharada Vivekananda Ramakrishna, right? SRV, Sharada Ramakrishna Vivekananda Associations. So you've done your salutations to the guru in that way. So you do that every time you sit before meditation, even before you take up your beads, and do the mantra given to you by your guru. And this is what I'm speaking about this morning as a preamble here to my second class. We need that, that kind of bucket uh, for, the, for the Dharma drops that are going to come to us in the form of experiences throughout the day. Uh, you might say that Dharma bucket has a nice filter across the top of it, so it's only going to let in those things that are worthy of retainment, like Gaudapada calls it the province of the enlightened in his commentary in the uh, Mandukya Upanishad. Uh, that uh, you know, the kind of samadhi where you, you know the difference between what to take and what to leave, and then the samadhi where you know what to take and keep, and then the samadhi where you keep it and retain it. So you can't just be letting something uh, sit, even once you've got the receptacle for it. Your mind, it's, it's all in a, really a metaphor about your mind. Your mind has to be that f same time, simultaneously, your filter and your allowance of w w what you're going to deem most important in your life to keep on hand. Of course, that would be Brahman. I was talking to someone just the other day and saying that, that they were having relationship problems and stuff. And I said, well, you know, you only have one friend here. <laughs> That's God. <laughs> the only friend you have. And the person said, you're right about that. So you've got seven billion friends, if you can see God in all of them, would be another way of saying that on this plane. So they're not necessarily all seven billion are not going to see the same in you. Uh, that would be a wonderful world. But this world is anything but wonderful. Uh, Swami Vivekananda called it this old witch, the world. So we've been at it, kicking a dead horse here for lifetimes. These lifetimes are all lived in our mind, by the way, not out here. Uh, else we couldn't make sense out of a million lifetimes because we can't go back that far in history, physical history in a linear time to find us still walking upright to have lifetimes. So it has to be inside all of this happens. Uh, the kingdom of heaven within you, that's your dream state, basically. and. If that confuses you a little, you have to then extend it and say, well, like Ram, Ramana Maharshi did, you know, this is dream number one here, and tonight you'll go to sleep and you'll have dream number two, and then you'll come back to dream number one. That was kind of an upgrade on Gaudapada's teaching of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So um, you're dreaming when you're in form. Uh, the whole thing's a dream. Row, row, row your boat would be the Western way of saying that. <laughs> and uh, you need to wake up. Uh, and when you wake up, ironically enough, waking and dreaming disappear. They become the same thing. Inner and outer, right? They become the same thing. That's, that's what the teachers tell you. Take this external, connect it to the internal, realize that they're one thing, and then connect that to Brahman, which is the ultimate one. The ultimate one. And uh, then you live in a state of contentment and peace all the time because you've settled all those matters. Uh, that would be better than a Dharma bucket. <laughs> that would be called self-realization or enlightenment. And then you're seeing name, form, time, space, and everything that was once Maya, and you had to be careful of it. That all just turns to Brahman. And uh, uh, Sri Krishna, when we were hearing him uh, this morning when Niran John was reading from the Gospel was saying uh, people who are attached to the world, they can't hear that teaching. It's, it's just uh, their filter is too dense 
for that for for that kind of thing. So it's not going to translate into any self-realization for them. Uh, only people who have awakened. And about awakening, Lord Buddha said uh, that there were two kinds of people, the awakened and the sleeping. And this is, of course, speaking spiritually. Awakened to higher conscious or not. And his student came up to him and said, well, there's a third kind of person, right? A person who's trying to awaken. And Buddha said, no, the person who's trying to awaken is already classed among those who are awakened. So if you have any yearning at all for your true nature, true true nature would be ec ecstatic bliss and un unalloyed peace, uninterrupted peace of mind. And if you have any yearning for that at all left in this old witch, the world, then you know that you're already spiritually awakened. You might as well just pat yourself on the back and be content <laughs> and go about your life without all this angst and worry, which is unnecessary, which is all a part of Maya. And then just, you know, get thee behind me, as Jesus said, get thee behind me. And in front of me then is what's left over. So I was talking about that yesterday with the Amrita Nada Upanishad. Remember we started out and, uh, saying that uh, those nadis will open up, you know. One of the ways to do that would be to breathe. We're, we're, we're in the midst of that right now. Breathing is a, a key to getting everything from oxygen to the brain uh, to teachings to the mind and everything that's in between is this prana that we want to have flowing. We, we chanted that last night, right? Om apyantu mamangani vak pranaschakshu shrotamatra balamindriyani cha sarvani. There's all of that, cha sarvani, which means balamindriyani, your five senses, your mind, and your prana, pranas chakshu, your, your sight, chakshu, all, all of that uh, is, uh, is, is necessary to purify and have the prana moving through that so that you can realize Brahman. So you can expand your mind in its knowledge to know and in, in, in its ability to know Brahman. So that's why all of this is um, always on the mind and lips of the illumined souls. And because people are always forgetting you see the simple basics like breathing. Um, so how to bring consciousness to bear like her realm. You see, the Divine Mother's realm is that third eye, Jnana Chakshu, the, the eye of wisdom. I found it listed in seven different religions of the world. I could have brought that chart and showed you. Seven different religions mentions the center as the seat of wisdom where she is, her wisdom. And so as we approach Durga Puja, which is next this coming week, the next few days we'll, we'll have the first day of Navaratri. So we were ahead of time here in Portland uh, doing our puja to, to welcome everyone else into Navaratri. Uh, Navaratri, nine days, nine nights. So here you have it here, you see. I wasn't going to start with this chart, but it's come up necessarily or naturally um, nine days and nine nights. Well, is that just enough to know that and worship it? Uh, well, it wasn't for Vyapaka because he sent out last year, last Durga Puja, he sent us out the names of all the goddesses that are worshipped on each of those days. And we saw it on our wisdom website there. So there they are. Uh, the first day next week, this coming week, we'll, you'll, we'll be worshiping, worshiping um, Shalputri is one of the uh, aspects of the goddess. Then Brahmacharini, that's the, the pure uh, aspect. Then Chandraganta, and then Kushmana, then Skandamata, then Katyayani, and then Kalaratri, which we were chanting to last night, and Mahagauri, we were chanting to her last night also, and Siddhatri the holder of perfection. So these are each one of the nine days, nine nights that goes by is dedicated to one of the aspects of the goddess. So she's got very m m differing forms, you see. And that's what we were talking about <coughs> when we said that you, you have to know, the seers tell us that, that uh, the primordial power 
of Brahman takes on forms. So it turns into everything. I'll show you later with the streaming particles of wisdom chart how everything comes from pure intelligence down into various levels of form, all the way down to earth, air, fire, water, and ether at the, at the stula or gross level of manifestation, where we find ourselves, right? where we find our bodies consisting of those five elements, ex existing in a world made of those five elements, and with the five senses attached to them, not just attached to them, connected to them, if you're attached to the five elements, then, then that's called bondage. And uh, that spiritual suggestion I just mentioned probably will never occur to you, will not occur to your mind in this lifetime, unless by some stroke of good karma or a teacher coming into your life. But um, if you know the connections of earth to smell, water to taste, fire to sight, air to touch, and ether to hearing, like you're doing right now. You're hearing dharmic vibrations come across the air, the ether into your ears. The, the connection between the senses, the elements, and, and consciousness, intelligence, is, is uh, again, so important, but so easily overlooked. So you, you even go to school with the aparavidya. We were talking about that. You know, the lower knowledge, your secular sciences and subjects that you make money with, and uh, you find yourself sitting in class listening for all the wrong reasons, really. You're not sitting there listening uh, to um, uh, find out how this connects to, to the real self, you know, through the mind, to Brahman. You're, you're, you're going there to learn some intellectual knowledge that's going to make you better, uh, earn you a higher pay, you know, and things like that. Get you a job, situate you on this, in this old witch the world in a better way. <laughs> but you're always just at different tiers of the old witch <laughs> until you're free of it. And, and then you can really see it as Brahman. It's not like you have to go running off and transcend the world somewhere in a cave, like some beings might do that, some yogis. But you just bring it, pay it all back forward and strip, strip delusion out of it and see it as what it is. Uh, there are many methods to do that and we looked at one of them yesterday, the Sadanga Yoga. We're still looking at Sadanga Yoga in this Upanishad. So, um, those connections between the five elements and the five uh, senses are, are key to the involution process. Otherwise, there's no involution in science. Uh, it's just evolution. And Big Bang, then it ends somewhere, and that's it. And you've got one lifetime in those 1,420,000,000 year cycles. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Actually, the whole cycle is in you. You're the eternal principle, and all of that's the illusion of time passing through your mind and through the collective mind and through the mind of the Trinity, too. So if you don't have the connections back inside, starting with Yoga 101, which, by the way, <laughs> is not shifting your body into different pretzel shapes. That's not even yoga yet. That's, that's some, some form of physical exercise you're doing with very minimal benefits. But Yoga 101 is connecting the senses, the objects to the senses. That's your first road in, if you've if you've gotten so lost that you think the world is real, then to find out that Brahman's the only reality, that's your first road in, is to meditate upon the, the relationship between the objects and their senses. Because when you took the objects and senses at face value before, you not only thought that this was the only reality, i.e. matter is real, or is the only reality, but you also started developing these habits around objects, you know, covetousness and possession and uh, pleasure and pain and that they give you. And I mean, what's in an object after all? It can be stolen. Uh, it can stop working, like so many things today. <laughs> Gadgets. Uh, uh, you can become bored with it. 
it can uh, so many things go on with objects and you still keep coveting them you see and going after them so what about seeing them as expressions of the mind like thoughts holy mother said it's all all, th all objects are just thoughts so there she's giving you a quick clue you know to go inside and if you don't have the connection between my uh, objects and senses then you don't have you can't make the first step because you're still out there with objects thinking they're real and coveting them possessing them uh, going to war with other countries so you can have theirs whatever it is that objects make people do you know it's just uh, not even step one i wouldn't even i wouldn't even call it true life what to speak of spiritual life there's eternal life and that's a far cry from from what most people worship here which is objects and things but um, until you make that turn of the ego mind mechanism away from physics and physical things and at least go to a metaphysical level that's called health and shamanism and things like that and then go further than that because you're worshiping nature and its powers is is a dead end too uh, all religions if you look back at their history they started off worshiping the elements and the the most the ones that lived the longest and were most successful and led to illumined souls went beyond nature they all went beyond nature that's why we have last night you know Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Eva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Eva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. That's why we have a trinity, because in the beginning it was like, you know, a, a pantheon of powers, gods, of nature, the fire god, the air god, the wind god. You, you couldn't shake a stick at all of them. There were so many of them. You see, so pretty soon it's like, oh, we got to slim this down. You see, and that's all an involution that's going on, from varieties, you know, to the more specific, to you know, and then. Pretty soon it gets from the specific to the inward general. Everything, you see the, the collective mind and everything that's within, inside of you. And uh, you're following the track of the so-called evolution of your own consciousness into a body, which is a dream you were having. And you're just waking up from that dream and you're just coming back to square one, to I am. And along the way, you'll meet the Trinity and say, well, yeah, we're the slimmed down version of all those gods you just saw. You know? So now you can worship us and sing us a song. Okay? And you'll be worshiping, you'll be meditating on the Mahat, okay? the, the, the great mind, which is, which is the, <laughs> the Dharma bucket of all Dharma buckets. <laughs> all the teachings are there and just waiting to be ladled out to you if, if you would just come forward and ask for it and uh, it's it find eventually find out it's it's all your own wisdom there, there really are no gods there's not even a god if you want to go to buddha and father of yoga and others what do you mean a god i'm that my, my consciousness is that but i'm going to have to strip away senses elements, senses, uh, uh, mind, intellect, uh, and finally even the trinity and the cosmic mind to know that because these are all uh, grander dreams I was having. See, these are all uh, more manifestations that I was taking on. So that's why you, the breath, right? I mean, breathe it all out, give it up then take it take all the real knowledge that's worth keeping in and hold it that's the breath isn't it breathe it out breathe in hold so forth and they want you to do it now with with words of power instead of uh, words of superficiality you see, mundane words banal words 
words that don't have anything in them. Gossip, uh, kind of. I mean, he was calling it, I said, what were you doing uh, while you were eating your prasad meal after the puja? And the person said, we had the d divine gossip going on. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the minds of the, of the high-minded ones, they just, they have a default zone that's much higher than most people. Most people will just easily give up anything profound just to be superficial, just for the sake of being superficial and entertaining words of common nature. But the seers never do that. They can only come down so far. Like Sharmakrishna said, my ears are burning with the talk of worldly people. Mother, send me devotees, send me people I can talk to. So then the weeks roll by and Swami Vivekananda shows up, Narendra, and Rakhal shows up, Swami Brahmananda, and Swami Premananda comes, and you know, and all of a sudden he's got these 16 direct disciples that want to hear only about Brahman. Uh, oh, weren't we talking about that yesterday in terms of Prachahara? Prachahara really is if you think it, it happens because you've mastered distractions, isn't it? You've mastered distractions. And, and so that made you open to concentration through reasoning. So we went through that yesterday. I'm going to take it through you again, but it, it all started really with this uh, connecting of the, of the breath and the prana. See, how are you going to connect the objects to the senses and not see the prana? I mean, my eyes see the objects. That's the prana that's doing that. Otherwise, are, they, are the objects and, and the eyes somehow sentient? Uh, they're insentient. They're, they're dead matter. They're not just dead when, when, uh, when uh, their outer life changes. They're dead when the prana leaves them. See? So the outer form can come and go, but the prana is still there, you see. And especially for the soul who's breathing in Brahman. Kumbhaka, we called it yesterday. We'll get to that teaching soon. Uh, so how to, how to connect such variances? You're doing it out there with such variances. Uh, and it's not doing you any good, see. But what if you started to take up all these variances on the inner plane, like we worshipped last night with the Durga Puja, and now we have to somehow bring that worship that's sort of alien to the Western culture, that was borrowed from another culture, if you want, and bring it into a classroom that now we're teaching about Dharma and from another culture. How is that going to, you know, coalesce here? Uh, worship and learning, worship and wisdom, two good W's there. So some people don't worship, you know, and some people who are illumined don't worship. <laughs> um, some people can't understand philosophy. It's just not in their power right now or their desire to spend a lot of time in books and philosophies and so forth. So th this bhakti yoga and jnana yoga, you see, so w we've got two other yogas then, meditation and work, right? Action and inaction. So each of those are another route for people to take. So some people, they hear about meditation, they go, that's me, and they're gone, see? That's all I do, meditate. Other people, most of them, I think I want to act, <laughs> you see? This life is for action, and I've got to go out and throw myself into it, and a cause and effect, you know, devil take the hindmost, just throw myself into it. But to coalesce them, like I'm saying, with worship and, and uh, her presence, her form, with her wisdom, you know, is, is like two wings of a bird. You know, a bird cannot fly without two wings, so spiritually speaking, you're going to want to take up bhakti yoga and jnana yoga and consider those your flight path, you see. And the runway in front of you is action. And the sky is your meditation. And that's how you're going to put four yogas together and live a divine life, which is, by the way, 
the reason you came here. No doubt. Sri Ramakrishna says it right there in the Gospel. You've come here to realize God. What happened to us <laughs> that we forgot that? No, why don't we forgot that that's the reason we came here? We forgot God. And I, I know it sounds contradictory. I just said God doesn't exist, but God doesn't exist in books and temples and churches and all of that. Uh, that's, that's the outer form. You know, and you have to be careful with the outer form because it can fall. Somebody was telling me the other day, you know, ever since I met you, Babaji, my vocabulary has changed. I was at work and I was talking to someone and I said, over the long flux of time, <laughs> and, and the person said, what are you talking about? And he realized he was using a phrase from the Gita, over the long flux of time. And so I got that from you, Babaji. So, and I got it from Krishna. So, anyway, over the long flux of time, religion falls. It's, and there's going to be some people that are viciously defensive about that. My religion will never fall, but if religion doesn't serve you, it doesn't put food into a starving person's mouth and wipe the tears of the widow and the bereaved, then it's not a religion at all, Vivekananda said. I won't follow it. And if your religion is based on someone having to shed their blood for you, then I won't follow it, he said. You need to shed your own blood. You need to stand up for your own self because no one can save you but you because this is your dream. You see, you're going to go into a dream and ask someone else to save you when it was your dream that you created it through? Wake up. O oh mind, O oh soul, wake up. You must, you must. You walk through life with eyes wide open, but you're dreaming. It's right in that song I could sing you. So, this eye open, that's her eye. If you want to awaken, then you put your prana there, you see, and put your love here. And uh, you put your body here, see one position. Buddha sat like this for 50 days in order to get nirvana. He probably moved about. They don't say that part. But he was under the bow tree for that many days. Christ was in the wilderness 12 days and 12 nights, was it? Muhammad was in the desert for... A, so they all went away and they just like placed their body somewhere and they put their energy in, their, in the head. They put their love in the heart and uh, breathed and then stopped breathing and went into meditation. They gave up action and went into inaction. <coughs> and realized, as Krishna says in the Gita, that one who uh, realizes that action is in inaction and inaction is in action, that one truly sees. So they, they found out that action and inaction were the two sides of the same coin kind of thing, and that they should master both. In fact, they should be acting without acting, breathing without breathing, uh, being born without having a birth, dying without believing in death, and uh, turn everything toward that, what I just chanted about. You see. Uh, uh, her very being is the essence of non-duality. That's non-duality there, at least as far as words can express it. So, if you connected, and I'm trying to bring this forward to our Upanishad here through these connections, if we connected five elements to the five senses, you saw what I did last night, right? I mean, sometimes before the puja, I, I kind of hate to do it because it kind of changes the mood. But I just walked in and I started doing the puja. And we inaugurated Shakta Dvaita Kali and put her on, on the beautiful pedestal that Anurag made for us. Thank you very much. Good work. Beautiful marble pedestal. And uh, named her. And uh, then I, I went right away in, into the purification. So you heard the Sutradhar. Annapurna was not Annapurna anymore. So she just became the sutra drawer, and she was reading out the order of the puja, and I was enacting it. And I gave up my body too, and took on the worshipper's body. 
So when I started out, it was uh, purifying the five elements, wasn't it? So you saw me, uh, you know, sprinkle water on, on land, you know, draw a diagram, take a metal earthen kosha, put it there, pour water in it, sing a power word, put a flower there, put a leaf there, then a flower, then some grass, then some rice, and then do some uh, mudras, you see, and uh, say some mantras. And that was all over in a couple minutes, you see. And that was, you know, uh, then I went on to purify my senses, lips, nose, ears, eyes, body, head. And then I went to the nyasas, which were the inner purification. I had to, I had to address the ancestors for instance, open the path to them, throw rice at the windows and doors and things. Because these are passages, you know, that beings come through. I mean, we're coming through a door into the ashram, going out another door, through a passageway, or looking out a window. The ancestors are doing that too, and you're doing that in dream. These nadis are just passageways with doors. And when you fall asleep, you finally open the door and you, you go inward towards the heavens, towards an inner world. And you don't know what you're doing usually, you're not conscious of it, which is the point, you want to be conscious of it, which is why you breathe, so you will be conscious of it. <laughs> I mean, because when you, when you go into deep sleep, you're not gonna breathe for 10, 12 minutes at a time. And you're not losing any brain cells because of that. Did you ever, <laughs> did your scientists ever think of that? At Kumbhaka, you can be without oxygen and breath for a long, long time and not have your mind get affected. So there must be something about consciousness being present instead of absent that controls the whole thing, that evens it out, that balances it, that protects you. And if you take refuge in that consciousness and connect it further to her, then now, what have you to fear? from anything, including Yama, God of death. What have you to fear when you're a birthless, deathless soul? Okay. And you can go along the passageways under your own auspice. Okay. Sure, you may have to, you know, Om Shrim Shrim Chandikya. You, you may have to uh, come to a guardian at the gate and say, will you let me pass? Uh, so you have a mantra for that, you see. So there, there's guardians at the gate, Herukas, and the Tibetans call them by different names. So you're trying to get to a deeper level of consciousness and they're standing in your way. You say, well, I have this passage here. Can I pay you this? What is it? It's a mantra. Oh, sure, pass, you see. So power words help you understand. You know, it's true out here, isn't it? With Aparavidya, you understand things by, oh, I got that, you see, I understand now. I'll just call that the long flux of time. <laughs> but it's the same inward then. So you have to be conscious of these words of the mantra. So you do it while you're falling asleep, you see. You just say your mantra while you're falling asleep. And hopefully when you wake up, it's the first thing on your mind. And, and so waking, dreaming, and deep sleep are just seen as three phases that one consciousness is dreaming through. And then there's fourth, which we talked about on the Upanishad, you know. And that took us to those slokas about Ruchira, the shining one, and Shiras, the mind, and how the breathing can be conscious, help you consciously connect to these inner realms, where seven, where nine goddesses are, are presiding, if you, if you want to put it that way, or where seven chakras await for exploration. And you've explored them all, but you've forgotten every time you woke up that you did that, you see. And how to become an awakened soul, a seer that sees. So those seers who know and remember the imperishable Shakti, I just chanted. And without her, all the tattvas would be like clouds with no rain. So tattvas are, are things like senses and objects. So you've forgotten their connection, so they don't, they're not giving you what you want. So you're always hungry, you're always thirsty, you're always eating, you're always excreting. 
and uh, that just goes on and on. Uh, but you make the connections to them and then all of a sudden you desire less, you eat less, and uh, you, uh, your energy, your prana gets finer and finer and it turns into psychic prana and you realize that the mind is the source of all of this. So that's where you're connecting things to. You're, you're connecting all the senses back to the sixth sense, the five to the six. And all of a sudden, your mind, you live in your mind. The seers live in their intellects. Uh, probably better to say they live in their intelligence, because intelligence is a container. I mean, intellect is a container. Intelligence is what fills it. So if you open your intellect, like a scientist does, or a, a person who's smart, a person who's smart isn't necessarily wise yet, because they don't know the source of wisdom that she is. So you'll have an intellect that's widened beyond the capacity of other intellects in the world. But you haven't got intelligence expanded yet. So when you can let go of the sheath, you see, that's this container. I'm not the container anymore. Let's just bust it wide open. And then there's this ocean of intelligence everywhere that you can swim in. It's not like you need a boat anymore. You know, you went to the island and you destroyed the boat. And now you're, you're feeling, like Sharon Krishna said, I felt like a fish that was kept in a bowl all his life. All of a sudden, someone poured it into a lake. So that's what I felt like when I went into consciousness, conscious samadhi, just unbounded, blissful. Uh, so through descriptions and through words, even though they're not entirely adequate to give us the anubhav, the actual direct experience that you can have beyond words, that's the Dharma. And that's what we're entertaining at this place, particularly in this day and time in the Western cultures, to uh, re help us remember. Tulya Shmriti, I chanted, help, help us remember that true nature that we are pure awareness, uh, birthless, deathless consciousness, uh, timeless, and uh, identify with it. It's going to be a little difficult if you don't make these connections. So that's why all of it, all the yogas, all the worship, the wisdom, the meditation, and the acts that come after you've practiced these three yogas are you know, like fencing with three swords. Because if you could fence just with one sword, it's called action, and people aren't having a very good time with that. You see. In the long effects of time, things are going to catch up on them. Karma, as it's called. But if you have two swords, you cut with knowledge, and then you act, Shamrakisha said, that's good, you see, because the karmas aren't coming back at you. You're not forming any karmas. Um, so that's one of the problems of the human condition is that um, we do an act, we suffer or enjoy, and, uh, and then satiation never comes. Uh, but we should we should do that once or twice and say, oh, I see how it's working, cause and effect. I give it up, and I'm just going to remain with my mind focused on reality. This is change. This is movement. This is transformation. Therefore, this is karma. This is suffering. This is misery, and. Uh, Pleasure is a kind of suffering, too. I'm tired of that. Yeah. So the wisest person will wake up from that the quickest, like Shankar at eight years of age, and remembered all his past lifetimes because he gave it up at eight years of age. So all those things are in the way are just like veils, and you push them aside, and you see your true nature is timeless. Your births are actually incidental. They didn't really happen. They were dreams, right? Did dreams really happen? Do they have any substance? Only the ever awake state has substance. It's called yogic insomnia. <laughs> Our founder, Lex Hickson, coined that phrase. I've got yogic insomnia, Babaji. I thought, oh, well, that's beautiful. It's like a Zen koan I had to meditate on for a while. So that's the ever awake state. And, uh, it persists. 
despite everything else. Bodies, levels of consciousness, uh, that's that one thing by which knowing all else is known. You know that story, I think, Upanishad. What's your question, young man? Uh, all the, the great old hoary old seers with their gray beards and everything sitting there, and this young man walks in. So he's getting admittance into the knowers of Brahman, the prophets and the enlightenment. He comes in, he sits down. What's your question, young man? Teach me that one thing by which knowing all else is known. And the elder like, went into samadhi. They came out and they said, that's the best question we ever heard. You're the best questioner. You'll go down in history as a knower of Brahman, the best questioner. You know, this is <laughs> sort of like Sharma Krishna made a joke about. It. They said, if you had a, a boon to ask of God, what would it be? Just one boon. And the person, you know, this is a uh, Chinese, Chinese wise man. Let's see. Basically, so what would it be? Well, I'd ask to uh, eat sumptuous food on gold plates with my grandchildren. See? Clever, huh? Might not be wisdom, but it's very clever. It's because if he has sumptuous food, he'll never go hungry. And if he has gold plates, he's rich. And if he has grandchildren, it means he has a long life. Figure it out. Do the math. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, you know, one-upmanship, you call it, you know, you come around to teach me that one thing by which knowing all this is, is known, then they have one word for you, Atman, and three other words, thou art that, and he walks out in a state of samadhi, you know. He's living liberated from that point on, because he, he was ready to ask that question. He was qualified for it, and he found the right teachers, and they gave it, and that was it, game over came over. Maya took flight. It, it never existed in the first place. And now he realized it never did exist. It was all Brahman all the time. So how Maya flummoxes us and covers us like green scum over a lake. So you have to exert, right? Ah, now I can see my face. Sri Ramakrishna said to his devotee, spread that. So he looked in there and spread. Oh, there we are. And then the greens come came dancing back. So that's the old witch of the world. I mean, so in this body, in this world, you have to be on vigil. That's the thing about spiritual life. You have to be on constant vigil, and you have to get good at detecting the game. Sherlock Holmes, you know, the game's afoot. Any mystery comes up, I want to know that. Uh, I'll get to the bottom of that, you know, because it's trying to take away my knowledge of Brahman. That I won't allow that, you see. <laughs> I do not agree. I can still hear my teacher saying that. So a long preamble, but all things that you probably want to know in terms of this weekend, what we're doing here, and what will continue on next weekend at the retreat, um, and how crucial it is. So we purified the elements last night. We purified the senses. You were all in me. I was doing that, and Mother was doing that through us. So we've done that, and now we come back to what we started yesterday before the puja, which was breathing. How important that is, fundamental. It's the very first thing, pranayama, in a six-limbed yoga of the Vedas. And remember, we we're putting that side by side with the Ashtanga, eight-limbed yoga of Patanjali, which is a you know a wonderful system. Uh, it's just that there might be some things that you don't need to do anymore if you're born with an awakened mind. You see. Even if you have a few little karmas to figure out or a few little things to do, usually you'd come in and you don't have to learn nonviolence anymore. There are people in the world who are nonviolent. They wouldn't think of hurting a flea. Uh, we, we're just, the media is making it look otherwise. So we have to really hold our ground and you know, know that there are really good, pure, chaste, wonderful people out there who are actually thinking of the highest good of society. And yeah, you know, they may be altruistic, and they, they are working in an old witch the world. But the more refined their intelligence becomes, the more they'll realize that this is all dreamlike, and they can transcend it. And when they transcend it, then they can affect others. It's that's why we love the seers, we love our prophets, 
I was sitting with my teacher just up the street there, what's it now, you know, uh, 40 years ago. And uh, it was President's Day. <laughs> so he came out on the, on the podium and he said, you Westerners, you like your presidents. <laughs> in India, we like our holy people. And he started talking about the teachings mm -hmm. and the holy people that he had been with. And, <coughs> and we were all like listening. You know, we've had enough of presidents actually already, Swami, so don't have to tell us. So we were all there to learn the Dharma you see, and hear about his time with Holy Mother and how he knew Swami Brahmananda and, you know, wow, tell us that. Because we want to have holy company, you know, we want to be in the company of people who are holy and uh, we don't want to be defiled you know, uh, by, by low thinking. We, there's no reason why we should be defiled by that. And all political thinking is low, all of it. You can't take a side. You've got to transcend it. You cannot get to the infinite Brahman through the finite. And they're all thinking in finite terms. The scientists do. How would you make a friend out of a person who only believes in matter? And will use this intelligence to find an atomic particle, split it, and kill people with it. How can that be your friend? How can that be God? And the same as religion, conventional religion. How can God favor one country in war and not the other when peace is the nature of, of the soul? So the conundrum is, and Gandhi pointed it out very nicely, but the conundrum is, is that if you come to this world, you're going to have to put up with peace and war because that's in the mind. The world came from the mind. The mind has violence and, 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 a, and ahimsa both in it. So anyone who gets a hold of a mind, how are they going to use that mind? Just like when the senses get a hold of the objects, how are they going to use the objects? So it's just a deeper step in when you deal with the sixth sense, which is sukshma shirera, which is your subtle body. This is your gross body out here and what it's made of. But your subtle body is made of a lot of things too, and not all of them are all that positive. Otherwise, people would be getting along famously. You can't even expect people to get along in an ashram, I found. They're all thinking differently, and they're all selfish. And they're not keeping their mind on the point, and committing themselves to perfection that they their perfect nature. Their nature is not sinful, it's perfect. So you're thinking I'm sinful, you're thinking they're sinful, and that's the way you've been taught in religion then. Is religion really your friend? Or is that irreligion that's posing as religion? In books and temples, vain thy search. Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. So cease lament, let go of thy hold. Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags you on. So you've got a noose around your own neck. Somewhere out here where you can't see it, your own hand is yanking you here and there. And you're blaming God for it. When you are that God. Sri Vivekananda called that angels unaware. You're all angels unaware. You're all God walking around on two legs. Now as soon as you wake up and find that out, like we have in India, then you'll have thousands of great souls coming instead of you know eking one out of Europe every 2,000 years. So connecting everything to the breath is like the earth is doing that same thing, expanding, holding, contracting, when everything you see around you is going through this threefold motion, then why aren't you getting in harmony with it? See? So let's take one conscious breath. I did it last night, right? Eight repetitions of, of a, a power word, Saraswati's power word. Sixteen, hold. Eight, out, with the same power word. One pranayam. Now I feel like I'm again aware of my prana and its part in all this. Now I can 
act. Now my hand can move toward the Ganges water or the incense or a flower with purity in it. It's not like purity is going to take you a long time to attain. It's there immediately you think of it. That's prachahar, right? Immediately you think of it, it's there. So why don't you live by that law? Well, what's causing your mind to drift away from that every couple seconds or every minute? <laughs> you have to train yourself to to go out on the uh, on the pavement out there and make the street sacred, make your car sacred, make yourself sacred, sit in the car and drive it through sacred territories. You always have to be on vigil, you see. And that vigil is not only uh, higher consciousness making availing yourself of higher consciousness, but it's protecting you against lower consciousness. So there's two good reasons to be doing that. Because karmas are coming back on you from your own actions. Then you've got the collective mind out there. My God. And the mind of your ancestors <laughs> that just want to route you back into money making again and again and going to school again and again. How many times do you want to be in a classroom thinking, regurgitating the same knowledge you learned in your last lifetime and forgot? You know it all right now in this eternal moment. It's all present. Uh, so, like I said about purity, just be pure. And if something isn't pure, make it pure with your own consciousness. There's nothing as a Vedantist I can't do with that philosophy, Swami Vivekananda said. There's nothing that a Vedantist shouldn't be able to do. No evil, no sin, no problem, no impediment that you can't get over with the Vedanta. Because you, you're not burdened down by a denomination, for instance, in religion. You're not limited by a, a run of thinking like politics. Uh, and uh, you're, not, you're not impeded by nature because you've deified all that and got it behind you. You, see. you know that you don't, you're not made of five elements that the five elements came out of you, that the five senses were your doing. And brooding on those things are what's causing you problem. There's this curtain of nations that just falls down. That's, that's how they finally, in Christianity too, it's called, um, it's called the cloud of unknowing. There was a text called the Cloud of Unknowing back in early Christianity, and they were it was it had some esoteric teachings in it. But in India, it was like the same thing. Much earlier was the Curtain of Nations. So they're trying to explain why we went into deep sleep and didn't come out remembering who we are. You see, because we're basically formless, and we return to formlessness in deep sleep. So you know. Most people think birds have nests, foxes have holes, you see. But you don't have any place to lay your head here, Jesus said. So where do you lay your head? So are we really headed toward Earth as the final final frontier? <laughs> or are we headed inward towards deep sleep as the final frontier? That's where we take refuge. That's where everything goes away. All your problems go away including the problem of wanting to enjoy things, which you're going to have to be take on a body to do, right? So this is all like turning Maya on its ear. You're, we're all looking at it ass backwards. See? And you have to turn it. There's a beautiful song in it that says, turn and face the original. You know, give up the five elements and nature and its its magic show and turn and face the original. So you're going to have to just inside make some sort of turn and look at your true self <coughs> and leave your small self behind. The small self that you're clinging to lifetime after lifetime that thinks that birth and death is real and that thinks that it can get pleasure from objects and satisfaction and contentment from the world when it can't. It never could because it's a fabrication of its own imagination. It says so right up the top, you see, <laughs> about Sankalpa. 
He read it yesterday. So, I mean, a, a better version of that sloka is here. It is called concentration when you regard the mind as sankalpa. That's mental projection, by the way. And merge sankalpa into your Atman. So some of us may be thinking, of, yeah, Krishna said, you can't be a yogi if you are still under the control of sankalpa, so I've got to get rid of it. But no, you don't get rid of it. That's the power of imagination. You just turn it in. That's it. Today's imagination is tomorrow's realization, my teacher used to say. So you take the sankalpa, you see, that you're projecting everything out, and you just turn it back in and shine it on itself. Because you, you, that's the one thing you don't see is yourself, right? The eye doesn't see itself, the seers say in India. It sees everything else, but it doesn't see itself. That's a metaphor for the Atman. You see everything, but you don't see yourself. So you have to shine a laser back on yourself, turn back towards the original, and acknowledge yourself, and then retain memory of that. So they're trying to figure out why we couldn't. We came out of deep sleep, we went formless, but we didn't know what happened to us. I mean, think about it. Who were you last night for about four hours? If you really were or are the body, then why weren't you it then? If you really were or are the ego, the individual ego, then what happened to it then? What took over? And, and uh, when your senses gave up, you see, it, 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 they turned off to all this. In, then you were in dream, that's called your mind. Then the mind turned off, you see, and you were in a state of absolute formlessness that they say is consisting of bliss, but it's not a bliss that you remember when you wake up. So that's where the afternoon nap came from. Oh, I'm just going to lay down here for a half hour. I feel great, you know. But eight hours of sleep last night ran me ragged, you know, because I was dreaming all sorts of weird things. You see. But deep sleep, just a half hour, and I was perfect again. So anyway, long story short, the curtain of nations falls down, they say. And it's, it's, uh, it's made of fear. It's made of doubt. It's not really rocket science when they explain it. It's just an esoteric teaching. And uh, this fear and doubt that the curtain consists of is thickened by brooding on it. So people come back from deep sleep, the curtain of nations, and they brood on other things that they thought about earlier. And that makes, that exacerbates the problem. The things you thought were real become even more real when they were never real. <laughs> so then you have to somehow thin that curtain of nations, right? So when you stop brooding on things that don't matter, that take up all your time, that will never make any sense when you think you're trying to make sense out of them in the world, which is a dream. And you quit brooding on it, fear th thins, doubt thins. And all of a sudden you see light. You, see, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It turns from o o opaque curtain to, to a transparent curtain. So now there's just a thin little covering between uh, I and my father. That ego is called ripe ego. Uh, otherwise, it was unripe ego. Pakvahamkara, Ramakrishna called it. That's the ego that's rascally and problematic. But if you do practices like we're doing here, worship, class, dharma, so forth, then you have uh, a ripe ego. A pakva hamkara, you see, and pakva hamkara. So that is called dharna when the wise one regards the mind as sankalpa and merges sankalpa into the atman and then contemplates upon his or her atman, free of thoughts, 
free of thoughts. So that's what we started out saying yesterday. Is that basically, you know, they're trying to get you to stop thinking. But if you breathe, you think. So, okay, let's stop breathing. <laughs> then if we stop breathing, maybe we'll stop thinking. Or if we start to concentrate on breathing, we'll concentrate on that and we won't be thinking, like in deep sleep. So what happened there? Oh, it's called dharana, when I'm not engaged in sankalpa anymore. So you get up in the morning and immediately you're thinking, you see, well, I got to go out in the garage and putter around, you see. Or, uh, you know, today's my operation, you see. Or whatever it is that, that's in your day. You see. If nothing's in your day, you'll quickly put something there. <laughs> but why don't you just stay pure and free? and let it happen, you see, or disallow it. You have the power to do that with your own mind. But if your mind's not pure, then uh, probably your senses aren't pure. The objects will not be seen as pure. But to the worshiper, the objects are, are pure, you see. Sri Ramakrishna went, got down on his hands and knees once and put his tongue on dog shit. to get over his aversion of it. Because he knew that attraction and aversion were both traps. That's why he took a piece of gold and he took a piece of earth and threw them both in the river. Gold is earth, earth is gold. I gave them both up. So he got rid of his desire uh, for wealth, for all of us, because he never really had a desire for wealth. So why fill your mind with the excreta of the day, you see? It's all unworthy of you. You're the noble Atman. You should be conducting life. Life shouldn't be conducting you. We went through all that then. But coming back to pranayam, you have pure pranayam, you have the power to reason. What? What I'm saying right now is the power of reason. And then you have prachahar, basically no distractions, uh, outer or inner, he, they want. Thoughts or what thought produces. And then you can concentrate. Uh, the game's over at that point, as far as I'm concerned. If you can concentrate, especially if you can keep unbroken concentration, meditation and samadhi are just words. Then you'll be at one state of consciousness in which concentration, meditation, and samadhi are all playing off each other. It's called samyama in yoga, right? You're writing me about that. Samyaga means you take this, the upper three limbs and they're just one thing. So you think, oh, I'm concentrating now. Now I've got to go meditate with my concentration. But you're already meditating if you concentrate. Holy Mother said, does God exist only when you close your eyes? in meditation and cease to exist when you open them for action? <laughs> is God that, does that mean a thing which has to be dependent upon whether you see with your eyes or not? It exists all the time. It, that, thou. Call it it when, when you talk about its formless nature. Call it that when it's what you want to attain and call it thou when you have attained it. Uh, and it never changes. So Maya can't change it. Time with past, present, and future cannot change it. The, there's, a, there's a quote actually about Sadanga Yoga. Sadanga, sadanga Yoga not to naiva shudam. Guru Padesham not to naiva shudam. Mano Vanasha not to naiva shudam. It's in the Avatuta Gita or Ashtravakar Samhita. It means uh, a self cannot be made pure by uh, practicing yoga. The self cannot be made pure by manovanasham, destroying the mind's waves, not thinking. See? The self cannot be made pure by bowing and touching the guru's feet. Why is that? It's already pure. Yeah. So, you're thinking advitingly if, if, if you think that way, you see. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're thinking dualistically still. 
there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's a process I have to go through to get to that. And it'll take me so many lifetimes. But uh, it's actually, what I'm saying is just immediate here. Purity is immediate. Intelligence, immediate. Concentration, immediate. Uh, so there's where you would, Pratyahara would reflect what's coming. <coughs> so that was a kind of review with commentary uh, of a kind of um, taking stock, I like to call it, of everything we've learned. I found out that you know, if the point is to me just to make it through a bunch of slokas and say, okay, we've done this Upanishad, then, you know, we're just going to walk away and not remember 95% of it. But if I can labor it, <laughs> excuse me, you see, if I can labor it and take stock of everything we're doing in the 48-hour period, which is this weekend, and the participation that we've been able to give to those 48 hours that's purely dharmic and ultimately spiritual when when it's refined and digested and retained uh, then we'll walk away thinking boy that Amrita Nada Upanishad was really something and he didn't even get to the slokas yet so here let's take our break that's your